Good morning. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate you all being so energetic about this. It's a good program and I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, today for the program, this program, we're going to have Lee Emery. He is a security specialist at Splunk. Um, just a side note, Splunk is a system that allows you to check logs and, and uh, provide some security support for your internet working. He has worked in IT and information security for over 20 years with particular interest in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the intersection of law and technology. He has worked with and taught security professionals, technologists, legal professionals, and law enforcement officials around the world. He has chaired working groups on professional ethics and contributed to legal publications, including an amicus brief that appeared before the Supreme Court. Today he will present a talk titled, IA Will Change Our World, Not Necessarily for the Better. Uh, right now, please take a moment, silence all your electronic devices, silence only, uh, but we still encourage you to use the hashtag dawn or doom to tweet about your experiences. Thank you and enjoy it. Uh, good morning. Is my mic okay? Can everyone hear me all right? Fantastic. Uh, thank you for all being here at this early hour. I come from South Dakota, so it's even earlier for me, which is a little, little rough, but here we are. I'll do my best. Um, so I've been studying AI, and, and actually, I think my bio is dated because I've actually been doing this for 25 years. And about almost 20 years ago, I, I wrote about a 100-page thesis on AI, a history of it, and how it came to be where it was. I've been following ever since. We are now in what's kind of like the, the hockey stick moment of AI and machine learning where we're actually seeing a lot of the promise, not all, but a lot of the promise of what AI can do for us come to fruition. And it's happening in ways that are subtle, and it's happening in ways that are obvious. And we're going to talk about how uh, AI and machine learning are impacting our lives on a daily basis, whether we're aware of it or not. And then we're going to talk about whether or not that's a good thing. Does that sound good to you? All right, fantastic. Um, so uh, I always have to do a quick who am I slide because uh, you know, that way you know who's talking to you. But realistically, you don't care who I am, right? You want to know why this matters to you. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. You heard most of the bio before. But realistically speaking, um, I'm just interested in this stuff. I really, really find it uh, fascinating and I've been following it for a long time. I'm going to share with you some of the things that have caught my eye in the last year, in the last three or four years about what's happening. Uh, I study this as part of my industry, but I also study this as a matter of personal knowledge because it's something that affects me, affects my family, and affects all of you and your families as well. All right, so let's, oh crap, sorry. I hate animated slides, I, that was a mistake. I apologize. <laughs> um, <sighs> okay. Um, I'll try to be better going forward. I have a couple animations that I think I screwed up because of fonts. Please be forgiving. That's, anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of big data, machine learning, AI. Just to sort of set the stage for me, I want to know which of you think that we're in the dawn of these topics by show of hands. Who ever thinks AI is good and it's going to do great things for us? Fantastic. And who here is wondering about it but has this kind of nagging, sort of bothersome worry that it may do something that we don't expect. So who here thinks both? <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about the pros and cons. I'm going to give you the prologue, um, you know, prologue. Uh, the prologue is that we've been talking about AI and how to create an artificial generalized intelligence for, well, gosh, since the, I think maybe the 30s or 40s or so in terms of talking about it realistically, not in terms of theory, but in terms of actually how to do it. And the interesting thing is that we have a lot of ideas about what constitutes AI, and we say a computer will be intelligent when it can fool a person into thinking it's another person. Hey, it's happened. It's gone. That's in the past. But now we said, well, that's not really AI. AI is, really takes more than just fooling someone with a, with a lot of pre-canned chatbot answers. Now maybe a computer is intelligent if it can beat someone at chess. Done. Go. Done. Every time we set a, uh, set a bar, when we pass it, we realize that's not really what we meant by intelligent. So 
now what we're seeing is rather than talking about just a generalized intelligence, we're talking about from a functional perspective. What are we trying to accomplish? And what is it going to do for us that's going to help us be better at being people, uh, help us to extend our capabilities as, a, as people and as a society? So sticking with the pro, I will get to the con, I promise, but sticking with the pro, let's talk about some of the things that we can do um, to improve our processes, improve how we manage big data. Um, everyone here knows about big data because it's all in the news and everything, but I'm just going to say for a layman's definition of big data, it's a wondigious amount of information that you cannot possibly comprehend. Is that fair? Well, yeah, I made that up. I, I have a trademark. Um, it is so much data that it is physically, mentally, logically, whatever else you want to say, theoretically impossible for us to, to process it at the rate it's coming in. How much data is generated on a daily basis today? in America, in this room. Any idea? Well, I'll say that there's companies and companies and companies that are capturing megabytes, gigabytes, petabytes, right? A petabyte is like a, uh, what, megabyte of megabytes or something? A lot of data every single day. And there's hundreds and hundreds of companies doing this. And every one of you is generating data, and those companies are recording it. Um, what machine learning is going to help us to do, or is helping us to do today, is to process all that data in a way that is faster and more efficient than people possibly can, and figure out, you know, there's, there's nuggets of information in there, there's nuggets of good information in all this data. What information is out there that we can do things with that can make us, help us make better decisions? Um, a lot of the arguments right now in AI, um, and then using big data for, for making decisions is we find conclusions by looking at the data and people, statisticians, any statisticians in here? Okay, I won't make fun of them because they're, they're right, but they will say correlation is not causation. You cannot say that because these things are related that one is a cause of another. But you know what business people say to that? So what? I don't care. I know that if A is happening, then B is likely to happen. I don't know which caused which, or something else caused it. I'm still going to make decisions about um, setting flights, um, flight routing, truck routing, supply and logistics, supply chain management. I'm going to make all these decisions because even though I don't know what is causing it, I have enough data to say this is reliably the case. Just like people um, thousands of years ago saw that every day the sun rose, they didn't know why, they didn't know if the earth was spinning or the sun was going around, but they knew it happened, so they made decisions on it. By processing so much more data so much more rapidly, we're able to draw conclusions that were previously invisible because either there's too much data or because the correlation was too small for us to see. What else can uh, big data do for us, aside from help us make better decisions? Well, it can help protect us. It can help protect us because um, how many of you are familiar with the way that big data is being used for what's called predictive policing? Predictive policing, it's amazing. It's a great concept. It, here's the idea. Um, I've worked, I worked in law enforcement. I used to work for the Justice Department in D.C. for a while, and I taught a lot of law enforcement folks. And one of the issues that they have is that there are so many needs for effective law enforcement in different communities around the world, around the globe, but there's not a lot of funding. No one wants to pay for it. Go figure. And there's more and more people, and communities are larger. There's higher population. There's more interaction. There's more opportunity for things that we don't want to happen to happen. Um, what do we do about it? Let's say, for instance, we, show of hands, who here thinks murder is bad? Okay. I saw you not raising your hand. I'm watching you. <laughs> I, we'll talk. Um, we all think it's a bad thing. And if we know that we have, let's say in New York City, well, I don't know how many, like 9 billion people die a day in New York City, or whatever it is, um, more people than you, can, than you want, but we have a limited amount of law enforcement. So what's the best thing to do? Well, what if we could predict where crimes happen. What if we could look at history and figure out where bad things are likely to happen and we could just 
have the police be there already, would that prevent the crimes from happening? That's a, that's a question. That's a good question. I, I, I hear you wondering about that. Um, but the theory is that if we make sure that law enforcement has a presence in areas where bad things are likely to occur, then that's going to have a deterrent effect. And we may, we may save lives. And we all think that's a good thing. So, and this example, by the way, this is Lafayette, just so you know. And uh, each one of these little, um, these guys is a, a crime, like a robbery. These are assaults. Um, these are too many to represent in this one area. And by the way, this is not Lafayette, Indiana. I chose a different Lafayette because I didn't want to offend anyone. <laughs> I was planning, planning ahead. But um, what do you conclude from this map? Well, I think that you know, you probably want a home security, a Simply Safe or ADT around here. You probably don't want to go here at night uh, wearing flashy jewelry or you know, stuff like that. You don't want to drive your fancy car to somewhere where there's a lot of carjacking. Maybe you just want to live at the Oakbourne Country Club, right? <laughs> Not an option for all of us. But this is what police are using in communities around the country to figure out where law enforcement should be allocated. And that's really a good thing because we know that we don't have enough law enforcement. We want them to be where they're most effective. We'll come back to that. What else can we do? Um, how can we profit from having more information? How can we, how can businesses, how can individuals use this, this uh, bounty of information to make better business decisions and to make more money? Because really, this is a capitalist society. That's what we're all about. Is that fair? Some of you agree, some of you don't. Um, profiting, uh, using big data to profit help means that we can identify where markets exist and how to better serve those markets. Um, one example is supply chain logistics. Fascinating topic, right? Everyone loves supply chain logistics. I, a couple of people actually say yes. Um, what does that mean, really? Anyone here shop at Walmart? When is the last time you went to Walmart and you really, really wanted Cheerios and they were out? Has that happened to any of us in the last few years? Yes? Oh, all right. Unusual. I should have chosen something different like bread. Um, <laughs> stores are getting better and better at planning and, and projecting, purchasing, and what people want. And they're using this by using machine learning to look at big data, look at patterns of purchasing. But does it really change other than seasonality? You know, obviously you don't want snowshoes in June, but what other things do affect purchasing patterns at large stores? Yes? That's a beautiful example, and thank you. You could not have queued me up better. Um, what do people buy before hurricanes? Water. And who said Pop-Tart? <laughs> That's the funny answer, but the funny thing about it is it's absolutely right. Strawberry Pop-Tarts, in fact, go first. Strawberry Pop-Tarts, people buy the heck out of strawberry Pop-Tarts before hurricanes. Why? Well, so nobody knows why. <laughs> we, we don't. We don't know why because, remember, correlation does not imply causation. We theorize that it's because A, doesn't need to be cooked. B, doesn't need to be refrigerated. C, it's individually wrapped. D, kids will like it. Uh, e, it's easy to transport. And who knows what, any, any other reasons? There could be others. But we do know it happens. It happens reliably. Water, bread, generators, Pop-Tarts. The first three we would all have guessed. The last one, we wouldn't have. But because we know it now, Whenever there is a hurricane predicted, then Walmart and Target and all the, the grocery stores ship lots and lots of Pop-Tarts. Because they know they're going to sell it anyway, they might as well give people what they want and make money at the same time, right? Okay, so who noticed I slipped one other thing in there? When there's a hurricane predicted, so what else affects not just natural disasters, but weather reports? All the big stores now have contracts with like the Weather Channel, which is a subsidiary of IBM, um, because it's data that everyone wants, and other companies. And they look at this to use it 
they, they use the long-term and the short-term forecasting to tweak their logistics. And they do it in a way that, you know, how many of us rely on the weather reports? How many of us trust the weather reports? So I, I live in South Dakota. Um, maybe a couple months ago, 81 degrees out. I'm working outside. And suddenly what happens? Hailstorm. Hail about yay big. Pounded holes in my roof, hail, in 81 degrees in the summertime. So no, I don't trust it, but it's reliable enough that I still use it for planning and preparation. And so businesses that pay attention to the data and the predictions from all the historical data, <coughs> sorry, are able to use this to make a profit. What else can we do with big data? What other pros are there? Well, we can profile. Uh, we can profile to make better models of our customers, better models of our voters, better models of our society, right? Um, how many of you used to get emails that had no, no earthly value to you? Anyone? Spam emails? Um, my sister got emails, and I apologize this is too graphic for you, but my sister got emails about getting a penis enlargement. She did not need one. <laughs> she didn't. I, I, not that I know, but I, but the thing is that these, the spray and pray model of marketing is annoying. It's wasteful. It uses a lot of bandwidth. It wastes your money. It wastes your time, and it's no value to the company. Companies can create better models, better buckets, better profiles of every single one of you, and they do that today. Um, anyone here use Netflix? Okay, about 66% of you should say yes, because that's the population, that's how much penetration they have. Um, in Netflix, do you get recommendations of, you You like rom-coms, right? Yeah, that don't we all, right? And and you like, like um, what's it, terrorist, shows with a uh, action figure from a foreign country? No. Okay, I was just guessing. I, I was profiling you, but when I did so, I did so without any data. That's bad profiling. The companies like Netflix have some of the best data available. They know everything you watch, everything you look at, everything you mark, everything you start to watch and then quit. And so they use that to put you in one of, last I checked, it was about 1,300 different buckets. They have that kind of individual profiling of each and every one of you, and you're not fitting in one bucket. You're fitting in a bunch of buckets. These are the things that you personally like to look at. And by doing that, they're able to give you better recommendations of things that you're going to like than any other company out there. And that's why they have this amazing valuation. That's why they're, they're doing such a great job, because they're profiling us, and they're doing it, they're doing it effectively. Amazon, same thing. Anyone here use Amazon recommendations and they say, you might like this because other people who buy the same things you do have bought this and given it good reviews and all that. So profiling is good, right? It's, it's funny. Nobody raised their hand that time <laughs> because I chose the word profile on purpose because, well, profiling does have a little bit of a, uh, uh, a bias towards it. It has connotations. Connotations, connotations, cons. Let's talk about cons. <laughs> it's almost like this was rehearsed, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Um, so what are the cons of big data and AI and machine learning? How can it be used or how is it being used in ways that we might not appreciate? Is it being, well, let's talk about a few ways. One of the first is, Consent. We, that's the grumpy face I get when somebody uses information about me that I haven't authorized. How many of you think that companies are using information about you without your permission today? Yeah, every one of you should raise your hands. And why is that? Well, because you click the little thing that says, I agree. <laughs> that's one reason. Um, you, you have to click. Uh, side note, by the way, uh, in England, there's a study where people, you know, the Wi-Fi things you check. People gave away their firstborn child. They, they legally signed a legal document giving their firstborn child just for Wi-Fi. We don't read these things. We don't read these things. But more importantly, okay, pause. 
All right, let's reload it back in, everyone. <laughs> More importantly, um, even if we do agree to give away data for certain purposes, well, what happens when that data leaves our control? Well, companies, they package it. They draw conclusions. They sell this data to other companies. And that data about us, whether it's first level data or second order derivative data, is now a marketable asset. And it goes everywhere. Um, and we may not consent to that, or we may have consented to it without fully understanding the consequences. Ooh, there's another con. Um, I should have remembered that. Uh, but the data we have, that the data we create is also collected without our knowledge or necessarily consent. Um, hmm. How many of you have cell phones? Okay, what does your cell phone company know about you? Well, that's a good answer. I'm gonna go a little farther and say everything, right? Right, because you, you check your email, you do your shopping, it knows where you are all the time, uh, it knows where you're thinking about going, what you look up on Google Maps. We'll, we'll talk about that more shortly. But in consenting, um, there is a saying, and I meant to get a citation because I don't remember who said this. Um, if you don't know what the product is, you are the product. Has anyone heard that? Does anyone remember who said that? Because I, I honestly don't remember. Okay. <laughs> Let me Google that for you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I apologize. I got in late last night. I meant to get a citation. I apologize. But somebody else said it. I can't take credit. But it's true. If you don't know, if you're getting free email, you're getting free Facebook, you're getting free uh, mapping, somebody is taking every query you put in, all the information you're sharing, and attaching it to a tag with your name on it, with your face on it, with your picture on it, with your whatever unique ID on it, and they're taking that information and they're selling it. Um, are you okay with that? Maybe. Maybe it's a fair trade. Maybe in return for, I mean, I use Google all the time, but I do so knowingly. A lot of people don't know that all this, this profile is being built about them, and if you want to, you can go and collect that. You can find out what they have about you. But you'd have to do that for all the companies that are sharing information about you, and they only share the specific information they collect about you, not the conclusions that they draw and that they sell to other companies. So let's talk about other, other cons. Um, content, what are they capturing about you? Well, I asked you before if you have a cell phone, and everyone said yes, because we all have cell phones. Um, they know who you are, they know who you talk to, and um, that's an interesting thing, because they know more than who you talk to. Anyone here in law enforcement, or at all associated? So, you know about pin trace, right? A pin trace, a pin trace, uh, telephone wires. A pin trace is what police uh, will get when they want to tr tap your, to trace your phone, and it will keep track of everyone that you call from that number, and every number that calls you. And the time, and in the days of cell phones, uh, actually even before cell phones, the location the calls made to or from, that's a pin trace. It's interesting because it creates a network, a link network or link diagram of everyone that you associate with on phone. But you really want to know what they're talking about, right? Um, that requires a warrant. That require, that's a lot deeper information. Cell phone companies, they are moving your data back and forth. Email companies like Google, it's part of their terms and conditions that they can use the data in your emails to provide better services to you. That's nice, I like better services. But what if they decide something's better for me and I'm not sure about it? They're capturing all this information about me, uh, they're capturing deep information about me and they're using it for what they think is the best, uh, is a defensible reason. Um, Anyone remember when their, their motto was do no harm? Or don't be, don't be evil? Um, yeah, and now they're, they're, they're paying billion dollar lawsuits in uh, Europe because they're using people's data improperly. So evil is not necessarily a binary. It depends on your perspective. Um, the content they're collecting though can be used for their purposes because once they own it, you no longer have control over it. A little wacky, a little concerning. Um, what else do we care about? We care about context. As a, who here sees um, a triangle? 
Is there actually a triangle there? Right. There's an implicit triangle, right? But the context of how you see the information attached to other information from other sources can lead you to make different conclusions, to make other determinations of what you're seeing than just the single data points alone. Um, a lot of us will give away information all the time. No big deal, because what harm is that one little piece of information? But applications, apps on your phone, uh, Facebook queries, um, websites, and all that, they are being designed to incrementally build more information about you. Does that make sense? I mean, when you sign up for an email account and a company asks you when your birthday is, what the heck? Does it matter? Think about this, because a lot of people don't. When you sign up for email or anything, they ask you for your birthday. Why do they ask you for your birthday? Well, allegedly, because they want to make sure that they're complying with COPA, uh, which is a law affecting what you can and cannot do with information about people under the age of consent or under, I don't know exactly what age, but some age. For, it's either 18 or 13, I think. But um, that's okay. So maybe they have a legitimate reason to know the year you're born. We may lie. That's true. But why do they need to know my birthday? Why do they need to know the, the month and the day I was born? Well, so they can sell to other people that are marketing to us, right? They do it for their own best interest. And they ask you your, your gender. They ask you where you were born. They ask you where you live. They ask you your income. And it, they ask you in big chunks. They say, do you make between thirty-five and $45,000? And you're like, yeah, I don't care if they know that. But what happens to that data? That data is used to market more effectively. Um, Little piece of data, how do they add up? I, I know there's, there's a lot of people out here that think, well, as long as the data is, is put into big boxes and mixed with a lot of other people, it's anonymized. Nobody can associate with me, right? I hear you sneer, as well you should. Um, because there's a study done at Carnegie Mellon uh, where you know, anonymization of data is a big thing in businesses. Um, there's a study done in Carnegie Mellon where they said, well, let's find all the people named, you know, Jane in this area code between this 10 or 10 year age range. How long do you think it took them to zoom down to individual people with just those very broad brushes? There was one person named Jane in this area code in that age range. One. And no name, I mean, no last name, no address, just area code, first name, and age range. And you're able to narrow down to an individual. How quickly do you think that Facebook can narrow down to you, personally, with all the information that you've shared with them? How many of you set your privacy settings on Facebook? That's excellent. The rest of you should really think about it and uh, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you some references if you want to know more. Um, but sadly, it's not enough. You'd think it would be. But when you set the privacy settings on Facebook that say, don't show my pictures to anyone except my personal family, that's fine except those same pictures, when they're taken by somebody else and post on their feed, they're tied to you too. And you have no, as far as Facebook is concerned, no right to manage that. And so they already know who you are. They can identify you by your picture on your Facebook pages and your, your real name policy that they rolled out for a while. And they can tie that information provided by your friends, your family, your neighbors, all the pictures you post. Google, same thing. Uh, all the other co big data companies can do the same thing. And by aggregating, collecting all this data, well, there are companies that now have, oh, who is it? I think it's Axiom. Anyone heard of Axiom? How much data do they have about every one of you? On the average, 1,500 data points for every one of you. A data point is your name, your age, your address, your income, your gender, your gender preference, 
your marital status, whether or not you were uh, a veteran or in armed forces, who you work for, what your employment history is, all these data points. Say I have 1,500. If I were to list all 1,500, well, I couldn't. But if I, even if I could, it would take too long. Um, I can't even think of 1,500 data points, and there are companies advertising it to sell it in bulk, which should be worrisome enough on its own. But when you have companies that have that massive stockpile of data about you, that they're figuring out what to do with, what's all, what else is going to happen to that data? It's going to be a target for theft and for misuse and sharing. Yeah. As a matter of fact, a uh, side note, uh, when companies collect this data, um, you think you're giving to them so they can provide better service to you. But it becomes a bottom line asset. And, when the, uh, and sometimes there's lawsuits to prevent them sharing that information. They, they may have a policy that says, we will never share your information. Then they go bankrupt or they're, they're on hard times and they get bought by another company. The other company says, we didn't agree to that. What? Isn't that crazy? But we actually had to have a lawsuit to prevent, um, I don't remember, the, it was a toy company from selling that information as an asset after promising to never ever share or use it for anything except contacting you about your orders. Um, in theory, that lawsuit should have said to other companies, don't do this, but companies are not caught to do this anyway because that information is out there. Now that information, let's talk a little bit more about that information. I talked about when you're sharing your, your birthday. I talked about when you're sharing your income level and stuff like that. But, and I also talked about how they get it from other people. But that's not the only thing. Using machine learning, companies can develop theories about you. Right? They can try to guess and figure things out about you. What would be a good way to, um, to guess information about your income level? Well, there's a good correlation with zip code. What would be a good way to um, guess your, your race or ethnicity? Well, um, these are called proxies, by the way. Companies use proxies. They say, well, we don't know your income, but you live in this area. You're in a two-bedroom house. The average cost of a two-bedroom house in this zip code is X. We're going to assume that you're somewhere within a couple standard deviations of X. And for, for ethnicity, musical taste, the music you like, companies are, and I'm not going to defend it, so if anyone glares at me, I, I didn't make this rule, but companies are using it. They're saying that if you listen to Zero Lean, you're more likely to be this ethnicity, eth you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you listen to Enya, you're more likely to be this age, this gender, and this you know, um, uh, race, and so forth. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that they're making these decisions, and that does not show up on your profile anywhere. You can't see what they've decided about you. Just like when um, you look at a person, and you usually can't tell if they have a bias against you for gender or race or ethnicity or religion or whatever, well, sometimes you can. Sometimes you can, you can surmise by the way they, they treat you. But computers, they mask it all. The decisions that are made are made invisibly. Um, you may not even know that there is a decision being made. What's a good example of that? Um, huh, advertising. Um, when you're looking to buy a house, some of you have bought houses in the past, some of you are going to be buying houses in the near future. And when you go look for a house, that information is being shared with, with Google, with Facebook, and you're going to start seeing ads for realtors and stuff like that all the time. You are laughing. I, I, I want to talk to you later. Absolutely. And those 10 best things, that is not a general email. That same email doesn't go to the person next to you or the person behind you or the person across the room. That is personal to you. And here's the funny thing about it. And I say funny, I should say horrifying thing about it. That is based on that invisible profile that has been created about you that you have no access to. Which means, which means that companies that are selling, that are selling high value real estate can go to Facebook or they go to Google and they can say, I only want to show these ads to people in this age range with an income level above this and don't show it to black people. Really? 
in today's day and age? Isn't that illegal? Well, yes, it is illegal. It absolutely is totally illegal. It is shockingly illegal. Um, but it was being done. It stopped now a few years ago because they were caught. But the re reason they said they could do that is because, well, they didn't know these people were black. They used proxies. These people lived in areas that had a, um, they had a high number of black people and they listened to black music. And so they didn't know they were black, but they weren't going to send them advertisements for these houses that were presumably in very you know, white neighborhoods that didn't want to sell to black people. Illegal, yes. Happening, yeah. Um, if it happened that one time, you can assume other companies are doing it too. That should be shocking to all of you because this is not the society we're supposed to have. Um, but it's happening with plausible deniability. It's happening with companies are saying, well, we're not biased. We did this because the computer said so and the computer doesn't have any racial or gender bias and so forth. And actually, you know what? Let me just go back a second. <coughs> um, remember I talked before about police, uh, uh, predictive profiling or predictive policing? So that, we all agree that's a good thing, right? Less murder, less rape, all that. We don't like that stuff. But is it really that simple? I see a couple of you shaking your head, no, you're on to me. You, you know my pattern. Um, <coughs> it's not that simple because if you have, hmm, let's say that you have a 20%, well, actually, forget that. If you have more police in an area, you're going to have more crime discovered. You're going to have more arrests, period. More police, more arrests, even if there's a lower baseline crime level in the area. Now, some of you may have read about in, uh, I think, New York City, they, they have a, uh, um, I think that they, they stop uh, people, uh, they, they stop black people for, for drug, for suspicion of carrying drugs, like five or six times more often than white people. But the people they stop, the black people, have a 1.4% chance of having drugs on them. The white people they stop have a 2.7% chance. What gives? the predictive policing that says that uh, we need to have more police here, it has a flaw. Just like our prejudices, our individual prejudices are based on our society, our family, what we learn from our environment, so does the machine learning based on the big data. You know the phrase garbage in, garbage out, or life is like a sewer, what you get, or data is like a sewer, what you get out of it, depends on what you put into it. Um, if we take sample data, if we take historical data that's based on a biased, biased assumptions by police, then we're going to say, you know what, we do have more arrests in the south side of Chicago than we do in Evanston. So we're going to send more police there. And it's factual, there, are, there were more arrests there. But does that mean that there should have been more arrests there? We're basing our future decisions, our predictive models on data that came from a flawed or biased system. How do we get around that? I don't see any hands shooting up here. If you have any ideas on how we get around that, please let me know because there, there, seriously, there's, this is something I'm personally interested in. There's a lot of people studying this and trying to figure out how we get rid of those implicit biases. If you have an idea, let's talk afterwards. Uh, I'd love that. Uh, I'll be here. I'll be hanging out for a little while afterwards. But let me uh, start to wrap things up because we're going to run short of time. And I want to talk about control. Um, we know that decisions are being made about us that control things like our, our likelihood of being arrested, our likelihood of being shot, our likelihood of getting a home loan. And these decisions are being made in the background. They're not being made by, by elected officials. They're not being made by, um, by people that you can talk to and, and see their biases. They're being made by systems. Whose fault is that? Who do we hold accountable? Um, who saw the uh, talk across the hall right before, before me? This is pretty exciting. There were bombs being flown through the air by drones. There were biological agents and so forth. There are autonomous vehicles being used to destroy cities and, and city blocks and buildings and so forth. Um, but autonomous vehicles are actually really good, right? They're going to make driving safer. 
Does anyone here have a, a car with like driver assist where it keeps you from going off the lane? Awesome. Is it awesome? Yeah, it is awesome. I like that. Um, it makes me safer. Not the guy in Florida who decided to take his hands off the wheel and read a book in his Tesla. That was the stupid guy. But for most of us, it makes us safer. So let me ask you a question though. Um, how much is too? How much do you trust your car? Would any of you get in a fully autonomous car today? Yeah. It's reasonable. It's safer. It's safer than being a car that uh, the average human drives. So it's maybe not so bad. But when you get in an autonomous car, you are not just making a decision for yourself to um, abdicate responsibility for driving to to a company, to a programmer, or whatever. You're you're putting a lot of trust in in that system, but you're also making a decision on values. Why do I say that? Um, Mercedes, I think it's Mercedes, don't sue me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's Mercedes. Um, Mercedes has a really neat system where in their autonomous driving, in, in not the autonomous, I'm sorry, in the assisted driving, they have a built-in bias. When you're driving, if you are driving along a highway and somebody swerves across and it's gonna hit you head on, and the Mercedes can either take the collision and assume that your secondary restraint system, your seat belts, that the car knows you're wearing, your airbags, it's gonna save your life. Your car will be totaled, but you will probably live, you know, 80, 90% chance. Or it can swerve to the right and go off the road, avoid a collision with the car, the head-on collision, it could be very dangerous, but there's a pedestrian there. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a nun with a bunch of orphans. What does this Mercedes do? It is biased for the safety of the occupants above the safety of non-occupants. Think about that. Why is that? Why would they do that? Well, occupants are the, they pay the bill, right? They're the people that, that the, co the car company is selling to. But when you buy that car, you're making a decision and it may be a very defensible decision that your life and your family are what you're gonna put your money towards protecting. That makes sense. But we also have to be careful because we are, by making that decision, we are making a value choice. And by putting that programming into the car, the company and the programmers are making value choices. How many of you knew about that feature today? Okay, I, I'm gonna say about one or two percent which means that 98 to 99% of you have just, or you know, when thinking about buying a car, are letting a company and a programmer make decisions about, a life and death decisions about you and your value system. So, we want to talk about control. We have control over what we do and decisions we make, but by using <laughs> Never let somebody else touch your deck. Um, we have decisions to make as individuals and as a society. Um, machine learning is being used today in the background in a primitive form. It's not artificial generalized intelligence like we talked about at the beginning, but to make decisions that have consequences, that have real consequences. Um, I'll give you one more example of, of the control. Um, who here controls what you believe? How many of you use Facebook? Any of you use Facebook? A couple people, don't want to admit it. <coughs> Most people use Facebook, right? Uh, less, it's, it's not climbing like it was, but know that Facebook, know that Google, know that all the others are profiling you, the term we used before, and are channeling news to you that they think is of interest to you by virtue of the boxes and containers they put you in. Which means that rather than being, giving us, internet giving us access to all this wonderful information, we are all boxing ourselves in by the pages we click on, by the articles we forward, by the, so the tweets that we retweet, and we are creating a little circumscribed area that says this is the type of person I am these are the things I care about, and these are the things that companies are going to show to me 
an effort to get me to click on things so that they generate revenue. So in conclusion, we have choices to make and we have uh, ability to make uh, decisions, but the data that we're using to make our choices is being more and more circumscribed by our previous choices and by the data being collected by us and by the boxes that were being put in by big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, you know, one of the cho few choices we have left are things like voting. Make sure you go and vote tomorrow. That's, uh, I, I won't say, I don't care who, but make sure you vote. Exercise your choices while you have them because a lot of decisions are being made in ways that will limit your choices in the future and you should be aware of that. Um, that said, oh, shoot, okay, those, those are my speaker notes. They're not supposed to be there, but. <laughs> yeah. I know that, stop taking pictures, it's bad. <laughs> no, um, seriously, I'd hope to have time for Q&A. I know that I'm being thrown out of here in about maybe 68 seconds, give or take. But I do want to offer to chat with any of you. This is an area of intense personal interest to me. And, if the, and sir, you had an idea for me, so I want to see you later. Uh, but please come up and talk with me afterwards. Uh, you have my email, Lee at Splunk, if you have any ideas or thoughts. And um, thank you for coming. Appreciate the chance.